Hello and welcome to Indulge Podcast. I am Rupam Jain and today we have something really interesting as Brand USA brings its big screen film Into Nature's Wild here in Chennai. Into Nature's Wild explores some of the most beautiful landscapes in the USA narrated by Academy Award winning actor Morgan Freeman. A celebration of the transformational allure of nature and wild places, the film is a non-stop ride via kayak, bike, train, hot air balloon, zip line, kite, <laughs> surfboard, and more into some of the most beautiful but little known landscapes of North America. Guiding this journey in the film are three trailblazers, Native American astronaut John Harrington, Alaskan pilot and youth advocate Ariel Tweto, and record-breaking long-distance hiker Jennifer Farr Davis, who share a passion for connecting people to experiences in the world. And guess what? I have with me here John Harrington. Welcome, John. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking our time and welcome to Chennai. Oh, thank you so much. How's Chennai treating you? It's have you wonderful. been here before? No, I've not been to Chennai before, but I've been to India twice. Okay. Uh, last time was in 2007. Okay. And I was in uh, Mumbai and Delhi for about three days, very okay. short time. I just, I love it, love the people. It's a wonderful, wonderful country. Right. And how is Chennai treating you? Oh, it's beautiful. We came in last night, uh, kind of late, but got to okay. the hotel here. Um, okay. Everybody is so sweet and so <laughs> kind. And so, yeah. yeah, it's just, it's a wonderful thing. That's so nice to know. Have you tried the coffee here? Yes, I did. I had, uh, I guess, South Indian coffee, the, the well, three, one year <laughs> yeah, coffee. Right. Oh, it's yeah. wonderful. I love strong coffee. It was very good. Yeah, it's so nice to know that. All right, so we begin. Um, you're known as the first Native American to fly into space. Um, how do you, uh, how do the Native American people celebrate your achievement, and why do you think it's so big? Well, when I came to NASA in 1996, I was told that I was the first member of what's called a federally recognized tribe. This is a sovereign relationship. My tribe is like a sovereign entity uh, with the United States government. And so I was the first one to have been a citizen of a tribe right. that was in the astronaut office. And I found myself in a position where I didn't expect to be, okay. but I found it very important because there were kids that never had a role model in uh, that position before and take it very serious. Okay, so yeah. that, that's why probably you think like it's so big and they're, they're celebrating it. Yeah, <laughs> and, my, and matter of fact, before I flew, uh, <laughs> when I flew in 2002, they right. said, hey, John, who do you want to sing at your mm -hmm. launch? And I'm like, you know, who sings at a launch? Well, they wanted to celebrate my heritage. So they, uh, Buffy St. Marie, uh, she's Cree, she's from Canada. Uh, I'd met her many years before, so she came and sang at my launch. My, my tribe sent about 200 people down. Uh, we had uh, had a, uh, one of our a dance teams, a stomp dance team, was there, and uh, my parents danced, and I was on the launch pad. So okay, that's nice. Okay, so are there any um, Native American practices that you still follow? Um, my I was I was born into the Chickasaw Nation. My mom's side of the family. I did not grow up there. You know, I moved around a lot uh, as a kid. Okay. Uh, I think I've my great grandmother spoke the language fluently, but mm -hmm. she didn't speak it to to us growing right. up. And so there are many things that I wish I had learned early mm -hmm. on. But for some reason, at that time in history, in my in my family, uh, it wasn't shared much, which is unfortunate. But I've always been very proud of my heritage. I've always been proud of the fact of you know learning the language. Uh, there's a lot of things that you wish you had growing up that uh, I do as an as an adult too. Oh, do you want to tell us a little more about that? Like the language you oh, said, sure. languages. So I'd yeah, say, yeah, yeah, I would yeah. say hello, Bichukma. Like <laughs> hello, uh, so at my name. Okay. Chikasha Aba Noah, uh, Chikasa Above Walker, because okay. it's a descriptive language. Okay. So that would be my name. Okay. Uh, Chikasha Seya, I'm a citizen. I'm a I'm Chikasa. Hmm. And a Chikasha Shanampali would be like our language. And so there's a bit I helped do a Rosetta Stone. Mm -hmm. uh, program where I actually, you know, I learned certain phrases and we launched a rocket with a young man and okay. it was fun. So I'm learning. It's a, it's a tough language, but uh, okay. got to spend the time doing it. Right. So apart from the language you mentioned, I wish I knew a little more about little things, more things. Right. So what are those sure. things that you wanted to know? Well, growing up, you know, the, the whole history of my tribe was mm -hmm. not really shared that much with my family. Okay. But I've learned a lot since, and okay. I've really learned about where my tribe came from, what our migration legend was, where, you know, what our, um, you know, we would have, um, start off as two brothers, uh, uh, Chicksaw and Choctaw were two brothers that carried their families, you know, on a long journey from the west out towards the east. Okay. And at one point in time, they separated because mm -hmm. they had a disagreement on where to keep going. Okay. Well, it became two tribes, the Chickasaw and the Choctaw. Right. And so the Chickasaws continued to wander towards the east. So we settled, our tribe settled in the southeast United States. Mm -hmm. We came from what was called a mound-building culture. We built these large uh, earthen mounds that okay. are similar to pyramids 
in Mesoamerica. Okay. And so my tribe inhabited an area probably, I don't know, Mississippi, currently Mississippi, Alabama, mm-hmm. Tennessee. And their first contact with Europeans was with Hernando de Soto, uh, conquistadors. Okay. And that, did, that didn't turn out well for <laughs> Hernando de Soto. So, uh, okay. so I'm learning, learning much more of the language, uh, not language, much more of the history of the tribe. Um, there are, uh, the dances or stomp dances I've done before as well. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's still... There's always a thousand things to learn. Right. So the Native American was, you know, one with nature in the light of this fact. Mm-hmm. How do you see your role work, um, you know, with this particular film, Into sure. Nature's Wild? Um, I've always I've always enjoyed being in the outdoors. I mean, that's I grew up, I was born in Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma, right. but we moved to Colorado. We lived okay. in Wyoming. I love the mountains. I love being outdoors. And so for me, this was a natural extension to, you know, there were places that I'd heard of, okay. places I'd been before, places okay. I'd never heard of. So I like I like being outside. I live in the mountains of Montana now. I also live outside of New York City. Okay. So I live in the big city, <laughs> and I also live out in the sticks. Right. I live on a, a small yeah. runway near Glacier mm-hmm. National Park. So okay. um, I think my appreciation for the great outdoors comes through in this movie by sharing the beauty of the places we go as well as the beauty of the people that are there. You've pretty much answered this one, but I'll still <laughs> ask this. How did this film inspire you personally? I mean, like, can you tell us about your experience filming the entire sure. the film, the process? Uh, sure. Interesting thing about the film was about this happened about April 2018. Okay. My wife had just passed away uh, oh, in April okay. 4th of, of 2018. Okay. About two weeks later, I get a call to be you know, asked if I want to be in this movie. Oh. And it was like fabulous. I mean, it was one of these things that my wife was on TV. She had been a TV broadcaster for a while as a journalist, okay. was a writer. So this was something right near and dear to her heart. And I had no idea. So when they called me and I told them, you know, the recent you know tragedy in my life, my wife had passed away, um, they were surprised. But the, there were certain things in the movie that happened that was a connection to my late wife. For example, they wanted me to drive a 1963 Cadillac convertible down Route 66 in Arizona. Well, my wife, well, they, they were going to bring out, they brought out a, a Corvette convertible, not a Cadillac. My wife had a white Corvette convertible. Wow. Okay. Uh, we premiered this uh, movie around the time of my wife's birthday, uh, February 20th, 2020. So there's some neat connections to it. That, Very uh, personal yeah. connections. In your opinion, John, um, what are some of the most awe-inspiring natural won- wonders in the United States that people must explore? Must experience. Must oh, explore. there's a lot of them. Uh, I think the big ones stand out. We, have, we did National Parks Adventure, was a was an IMAX movie as well, um, that explored all these beautiful natural par- national parks we have. Uh, and they're absolutely gorgeous. Uh, there are other places out, outside of that that mm-hmm. we go to in this movie that uh, I think people have never heard of before. Um, there's one place in northern New Mexico called the Shishlapa. It is okay. a uh, area that is in the Navajo, Navajo uh, tribal land in New Mexico. And there's these tall sandstone spires that have been eroded over by time. And it's a, right. like a moonscape, almost like a, an alien landscape. And it's a long ways away from anywhere, but it's <laughs> absolutely beautiful because people can visit there. Okay. That was probably the most inspiring uh, place I went. A rural gorge doing zip lining, doing adventure stuff. Uh, just a lot of fabulous places, a lot of things in the mountains, because that's kind of my passion. Okay, tell us a little more. Like I'm, I'm really curious okay. to know. All... <laughs> See, let's try a few places in Colorado. We yeah. went. Uh, we we filmed a segment where we talk about the journey of Lewis and Clark. Okay. And Skagawea as a Shoshone woman that traveled with Lewis and Clark as they went, ventured across the Western okay. United States um, back in the early 1800s. And so we filmed a segment up in a place uh, called Molas Lake. It's way up above between Durango, Colorado and Silverton, Colorado. And there's a train that goes all the way over oh. to that. And it's this beautiful steam-powered wow. train that dates back, you know, like 100 years, I guess. And, and there's this absolute beauty up this river. And we, we filmed on this lake. I think it was about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. It was really oh. cold. And these folks were dressed up in uh, traditional, uh, traditional clothing that Lewis and Clark may have worn. And to be up there in this really cold winter environment in the mountains of Colorado and to watch the filming and to see how these told the story was a fabulous part of being in it. That was, I love that. So how would you describe this film, John, and um, why do you think people must watch it? Well, coming out of the pandemic, right? You know, yeah. we've, we filmed this prior to the pandemic. We premiered it at the beginning of the pandemic, which, you know, that was you know, no <laughs> fault of our own. But right. the idea is that now that we know what it's like to have to be cloistered into an you know, in, in, away from other folks outside of nature, now we can step out and we have that desire to get out into nature. And I think what this movie does, it kind of makes us really appreciate what we have the opportunity to do. Mm-hmm. And hopefully uh, it inspires folks to say, I would like to go there. That, I've never seen that before. 
And, you know, where is that? And start asking questions. And a lot of the folks we work with here in India, uh, they know the best way to get in touch, travel, travel uh, companies, to set up programs where people can come over and see these beautiful places. Right. Okay. If I may ask you here, like, do you think, you know, our lives have changed post-pandemic. Oh, do you yeah. think we are connecting better with nature because we were put into that spot? That, oh, yeah. yeah. Without, without, without a <laughs> doubt. Because, you know, we, there's this, you know, this natural, uh, for me, <laughs> there's this natural desire to get outside. I find comfort in being outside. My spiritual connection is to what's around us and, right. and seeing the beauty of the, of, of, you know, what grows and how we, and an appreciation for, from being in space, looking back on it and realizing that this is a very important place. This is all we have. Yeah. You know, people talk about going to Mars and terraforming Mars, making an Earth-like planet. Well, you know, we got a pretty darn good planet here. Let's take care of our planet. And if we can explore other places that makes life here on Earth better, I think that's, that's really what we need to do. That's what our responsibility is. You see, the neat thing about being an astronaut is you get to see the world from a different perspective. Yeah. And it's a perspective that gives you an appreciation for the world that you live in. Right. Because that's where you live. You, you right. fly in space for two weeks or six months or a year, mm. but you come back to here. You know, you don't, yeah. you don't go off to Saturn or something like that. <laughs> right. you, you come back here and this is where your kids are and it's where your grandkids are going to be. Yeah. And so you, you really appreciate, and it's called, it's called the overview effect. Oh, right. Okay. And, and you uh, go, wow, you know, I can... I need to take care of this because mm-hmm. it's, all, it's all we have. So you learned many lessons from the wild, like you've said also, and you're so connected um, more than from your school. Sure. Um, what is it that motivated you to become an astronaut? What motivated me? Um, yeah. Well, I've, I've always liked to fly. My father was a pilot. He taught me to fly. He gave me my first flying lesson when I was probably 10. Okay. I didn't become a, an aviator until I joined the Navy. You know, I had this kind of strange path. When I was eight years old, I used to sit in a cardboard box and play astronaut. Because <laughs> in the 1960s, we were, you know, we were going to the moon. Right. And I wanted to be an astronaut, but I didn't see myself in any, any of the people that I, what I saw. And so I never really pursued it as a career until I met certain people and I did certain things. Found myself, you know, I decided to join the Navy. I did really well in the Navy. I decided to become a test pilot. And I realized, hey, all those folks that I watched on TV growing up, Half of them had been Navy test pilots. They had been in the exact same school. And so, in the, to me, the natural extension was, well, I'm here. Can't I, why can't I go there? And if you don't apply to be an astronaut, mm-hmm. you won't be one, right? So I earned a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. Okay. Applied twice to NASA. And uh, bless her heart, they interviewed me and selected me in 1996. What is about being an astronaut that you actually like? Or the, like the most? Oh, the, I like not having the same thing every day. I like <laughs> having you know, excitement in the in the work that I do. I don't necessarily like working behind a desk. You know, we all have to do management things and right. such. But I love to fly. I came to NASA as a naval aviator, a mission specialist, which meant I got to walk in space. But I also flew the jet. I got to fly in the front seat of the jet. Wow! Kept my flight time. Every day was different. You know, I, I you know, I'd go. I know when I had to go to the gym. I know when I had to go <laughs> fly to Florida. I know when I had to go. You know, look at uh, space hardware. I know when I had to go to meetings. And so my schedule was, you know, it was so varied. And I like that. I like the excitement of it. I like the challenge of it. Okay. I like the teamwork of it, too. <laughs> um, from the perspective of both, you know, being an astronaut and a nature lover, what do you think we are doing wrong with the world? Oh, wow. That's a, let's get that one. Let's wrap <laughs> that one up. That's a great question. I think that there are a lot of people that don't believe that we as humans are having an impact on our environment. When the data, facts show we are, people ignore that for whatever whatever reasons, you know, and maybe political reasons. Most likely, it is political reasons, you know. And so, uh, that's bad, you know. If you know, you you can. Here's a fact: you can believe it or not, but it's a fact. Yeah. It doesn't make it, you know. Yeah. It's still true, yeah. you know. And it's up to your, uh, it's up to the person to be able to decide based on what the data is showing us to realize that we are having an impact on our world. Right. And so, I think we as a you know, as a collective whole, not just the United States or India yeah. or, or United Kingdom or Russia. You know, we need to come together and work, you know, uh, collectively to make the world a better place. You know, that's, that's a broad thing, right? Because <laughs> yeah, you know, we all have our, we don't have our disagreements, but, yeah. you know, it's an entirety. You know, if we're going to be here for as long as we'd like to be here, yeah. you know, generations, uh, we need to do what we can to, to work together. And I'll, I'll take a step back into the 1960s, Star Trek, right? Gene Roddenberry, if you look at the flight deck of the Starship Enterprise, you see multiple genders, you know, see, you see male, female, you see an alien, you see mm-hmm. different languages, you yeah. see, you know, a collective whole doing something for the good of humanity. And, you know, hey, he did it back in the 60s. That's, you know, yeah. they make, it was a TV show, but still, 
I think he had the right idea. Yeah, I mean, you'll see somebody drive by and toss his trash out the window. That, that upsets me. Yeah. I get really, and I'll stop and say something, you know. Yeah. I may get in an argument with somebody, but, you know, to ignore it, to ignore what else, somebody else's disrespect for mm. uh, the environment, disrespect for the home they live in, you know, you don't trash your own house. You're right. not supposed to, but people yeah. do. So I think it's our responsibility to take the initiative to be able to stand up to folks that maybe don't have as much appreciation for, you know, the beauty of what we have right. and hopefully educate them. I think that movie does this. Yeah. Will technology make us less sensitive to the world around us? Will technology make us less sensitive? Technology gives us more uh, ability to access information that can educate us. You know, you see a lot of kids on iPads and yeah. iPhones and you're playing this, but, you know, there's, there's a tool if they step outside the entertainment part of the tool and it's the education part of the tool, then they can learn that much more about, you know, how we do, how do we protect our environment? What are the, what are the challenges? You know, so let's take a tool as an entertainment tool and let's use it as an education tool. And I think that's what technology does for us. Maybe AI will step into that, you know, robotics <laughs> yeah. and AI with robots that can make decisions that they can do it on their own without being programmed. Yeah. You know, that's the neat thing about a robot. You can program it, but you program it. It yeah. can't make its own decisions, but maybe with AI, it can start making decisions that we as a human would just be able to do, and then mm. you know, and do it in a responsible, reasonable way. Well, we could we could be doing a video teleconference right now, right? <laughs> yeah. and we wouldn't have this connection <laughs> right, if right, we're on a video yeah. teleconference. Yeah. I could be in the United States, <laughs> video teleconference you here, absolutely, and it wouldn't be the same connection. Yeah. So I think having you know, stepping away from that technology for something else, you know, it's the right thing to do. Right. Okay. How do you see uh, our world thirty years from now? Boy, how do I see a world 30 years from now? Um, I'm going to be an old man. <laughs> I'll be in my 90s. Ah, she was. Um, you know, I hope my, my kids grow up, you know, when they're adults uh, and their kids are adults, that they're in a position that they can take care of themselves, they can take care of their community, uh, they can take, take care of the world around them. And having, a, I think, hopefully, whatever I have done in my career can give them a sense that it's their responsibility now. And they can pass it down to, we say, you know, for seven generations, we look forward maybe seven generations from now, what, what have I done to help somebody seven generations from now? And I think, you know, being a part of the space program and working on the space station and giving us the opportunity to uh, view the world from a different perspective and maybe do some research that improves life on Earth, I think then that's be my legacy, you know. Okay, you're a dreamer of a better world. I can see that. Yeah, yeah. Look, we got, we got, we're off to a pretty good start. Let's right. let's keep going. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, John. Hey, you're Thank, Thank you for you. being on the show and for giving us your time. You're it welcome. was so informative and lovely talking to you. Thanks. Insightful, also. Thank <laughs> you so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay in Chennai. I, I, I will. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Short you. Short so stay, much. but I'll come back. <laughs> Thank come you so much. Thank okay. You. With that, we come to an end of this episode. We'll be back soon with yet another episode of the Indulge Podcast. Till then, goodbye.